Doesn't John seem nice? He's like a nice guy. He's got a very pastoral beard. I can't wait for you to get to know him as well. Now let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word this morning. Father God, we come here this morning and this summer day, and we've been singing your praises, giving our gifts, and now we come to your word, which we, you've told us is living and active and is sharper than a double-edged sword. It's able to pierce our hearts and our thoughts and our intentions, and we don't always like that, but we need it. So we're asking you, Lord Jesus, the living word made flesh, to speak to us through your word. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. We're in a summer series you saw out there in the intro video, and if you have been new with us, it's called The Disciplines of Grace. Those are two words you don't always put together. Discipline sounds harsh, like training or punishment. Grace, is, it sounds nice, freedom, liberation. But the Bible puts these together in a powerful way in the life of the believer, the Jesus follower. Now, you saw the verse reference there, that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. We like that, forgive my sin, save my life. But the grace of Jesus appears and also trains us, same word paideia in Greek for the word for discipline, trains us to live godly lives. So God's grace forgives our sin and trains us to walk in grace, to experience grace, to live the way Jesus would have us live. And we've been walking through the historical and biblical practices, at least some of them, for Jesus' followers throughout the centuries. For how do you do that? What kinds of things do you do to walk in grace, to experience grace? The one we're going to talk about here today, this morning, is one uh, that is not popular, not all that fun, and there's a lot of baggage and misunderstandings surrounding it. It's the discipline of confession. Bum, bum, bum. Right? It's, uh, it's, we, we, we have an issue with this, confession. I, I talk to men sometimes who will say the two things that they fear about church is you're going to make me give, obligated to give money and feel guilty. I don't want either of those things to be true, but I understand why people feel that way. Like you got to talk about your, your sin. Uh, like, am I gonna, what, what are we going to do today? Are you going to bring up on stage and one at a time and we're all going to confess? How does this work? Or, we, or look at our culture and we see confession as you know, public personas, politicians, you know, business leaders, sometimes even pastors, celebrities of some sort who get in trouble. They get found out, get caught doing something they shouldn't be doing, sinning. And at first, what's the first reaction? How often is the first reaction? It's true. I've been hiding for a long time. I'm horrified that you know, but it's true, and I feel I need to tell you the whole truth. I did it. I was wrong. I'm going to back off of my role and work on what's going on in my soul and really try to clean this up. I'm so, so sorry. How often does that happen? No, never. It's, it's a conspiracy. They're out to get me. It's not true. I didn't do it. And then it's, I did some of it. And then it's the forced to save face and keep your position. Well, okay. We see that as confession. Or maybe you grew up in a religious tradition where confession was an obligatory thing. You went to confession to a pastor, a minister, or a priest to try to, you know, they told you what you had to do to be forgiven. I talked to a man years ago who was new to our church. He'd, he grew up in the Roman Catholic tradition, and he'd walked away from all religion and uh, walked away from God for many years of his life and was coming back, as it were, to God, finding his way back to God, and he was attending our church, and he was growing. And we met for coffee, and he said, listen, my priest, uh, when I was Roman Catholic, told me that you Protestants don't believe in confession, and that's why I decided to come here. <laughs> I understand why he might say that. So I want to tell you, we do believe in confession, or at least we should, if we take the Bible seriously. Now, there are some very significant differences in how it's practiced, and we'll get to that. But for the Christ follower, if you're serious about, we say this every week, experiencing grace, confession is a non-negotiable. It's one of the primary ways you experience grace. Do you want to experience more of God's grace in your life? then there's no wiggle room here. You can't get around this one. We have to talk about it. It's really, really important for us. Uh, my wife, you'll see an image here on the screen um, of our front yard. We like, she likes two things. Uh, well, several things, but two that are in, the, in view here. Um, flowers and the cubs. Uh, the, they just, that's the W flag, in case you're wondering, and they have won. 
Anyway, you, can you see that arm, the hanging pot there? We've got a number of those around our yard. And we had been on vacation. We came back, and we had a number of storms, and the pot had filled up with too much water and fallen over. It was laying there. The dirt had spilled out. The flowers were damaged, and, she, and, the, and the metal on that arm had been bent. She said, Jeff, can you put that back up? I need to, uh, it, you know, the flowers are not going to grow like that. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll get to that. For like six days, I pulled in and out of my driveway watching that thing laying there and didn't touch it, right? So then I finally, okay, pulled it up, and I just tried to stick it back where it was. Brrr, fell back over again, right? She said, you've got to take it out of that hole and fix the arm and put it back in a new spot. Okay, okay, I finally did that. Confession's kind of like that in our life. I mean, those flowers laying on the ground in the weeds with getting no sunlight, with the soil spilled out, aren't going to grow unless what? Unless someone addresses the problem, puts, that, puts them back in a condition where they'll grow and flourish. That's what confession does for us. We try to prop things back up in our life, right? What happens? Brrr, they fall over again. And we just kind of drive right by them, ignoring it. Confession is a way of, let's put that soil back and those flowers back where they're going to grow and flourish. That's what it's supposed to do. Proverbs 28, verse 13 tells us this. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Now, this is from the New King James Version, and I chose that version for a specific reason, because it uses the word covers. Your Bible might say conceals. It's the Hebrew word kish. And it's important that we look at it. It says covers for a reason. The one who covers his sins will not prosper. But who confesses them and forsakes them will find mercy. Now, in Psalm 32, verse 1, we read this. Blessed is the one whose transgression is kish. Forgiven, whose sin is covered. Same word. So covering is a good thing in certain times. You need to have your sin covered, but you're not supposed to cover it. Do you follow? Your sin needs to be covered, but you can't do that job. Covering your own sin is outside your job description and mine. I'm not qualified. I cannot do it. It's called hiding, evading, lying to yourself and to others. But it needs to be covered somehow. Proverbs 10, 12 tells us love covers a multitude of sins. John Calvin, in the introduction to his Institutes of the Christian Religion, says, there's no self-knowledge without knowledge of God, and there's no knowledge of God without self-knowledge. Both are true. Covering your own sin is limiting both self-knowledge and knowledge of God. So if we can't cover our own sin, and by the way, we've been trying since Genesis chapter 3. You know the story, right? Adam and Eve, when they first sin, the first sin enters the world. What's the immediate reaction when they eat the forbidden fruit? Their eyes are opened, and they realize they were naked, <gasps> and they covered up. They covered themselves. The first reaction to awareness of sin was shame and covering. And we've been trying to cover up our own sin ever since. And the Bible's clear. That's a job you're not qualified for. Someone else has to do it. So what can we do if we can't cover our sin? You can probably guess. Confess. Psalm 32, verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I didn't cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. That's how, that's our job. God's job is to cover. Our job is to confess. This is the purpose of confession. It's the restoration of a relationship. It puts us back right with God, the soil back in the right condition so that we can grow again. And the, probably the signature passage in the New Testament, there are many places, but one of, the, one, of these, one of the primary places that spells out what confession looks like and what it does is in the letter of 1 John. If you're new to Bible, the Bible study or Bible reading, John's gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John also wrote the book of Revelation and three letters to the churches. And we're going to read the first one, a part of the first one, 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a passage. The word in Greek for confession is an important one. So God's job is to cover us. To, he's the one who's faithful and just. He forgives and cleanses. He covers. Our job is to confess. Well, what does confess really mean? The word in Greek for confess is a compound word. It's the word homo legeo. Homo meaning same, legeo meaning speak or speech. So literally it means to speak the same, to say the same thing. What? Why is that confession? To say the same thing about your sin as God says about it. That's what confession means. To say the same thing the Bible, God's word says about it. To speak accurately about our issues, our hang-ups, our failures, and our struggles. This is profoundly difficult, isn't it? To, be, to speak accurately about what's really going on in our hearts. There's no spin control in Christian confession. There is in our culture. We, we, we're experts, I think, at, at, at trying to evade honest homo legeo, saying the same thing. How, how often do you hear somebody caught in adultery, the sin of having sexual relations with somebody not your spouse, and saying, it was a moment of indiscretion. No, it's not. Or uh, lies, an outright lie. You know, I, I shaded the truth. I misspoke. No, you didn't. Abuse, verbal, physical, sexual abuse. I, I lost my temper. I flew off the handle. No, you didn't. If you go right down the list, cheating. Your business partners, the government, you know, I, I fudge the numbers, I cut some corners. We see it all the time, and, and maybe those, you don't do it in that way, but we've all got little ways of not saying the same thing, giving ourselves a pass, letting ourselves off the hook. Let me give you seven ways that I think we try to evade honest confession. We justify first. It wasn't that bad. Yeah, it wasn't, I'm not perfect, but it wasn't really that bad. In fact, actually, I did a good thing, even though they didn't like it. We excuse. Yes, yes, it was wrong, but I was provoked. You don't know how she is. Or three, we hide. We avoid certain people, certain places, certain situations that will remind us of the truth. I've told this story many times, and it happens more than once. I'll be out in a public place shopping or Target or whatever, and I'll see somebody that hasn't been to church in a long time, and I know some stuff is going on in their life, and they look up and they see me, and I see them, and they see that I see that they see me, right? And they look down, and they go to the other aisle, and I follow them. No, I don't. No, no. I feel terrible. What, what's going on there? I am, I, I am a reminder to them of what they're running from, but it's what they need most. Not me, but God's grace, the church a place of love and acceptance, or at least it should be. So we hide. We rename. We talked about that. We call it something else. We postpone. You know, I'll deal with that later. I've got a lot going on in my life right now. I'll get around to it. We bargain. How many of you haven't said this? Yes, yes, I know I screwed up, but Lord, if you get me off the hook this one more time, I promise I'll never do that again. We deflect. Listen. I'm not a perfect person, but it's not nearly as bad as that guy. She's a hot mess. Have you seen her life? I mean, come on. I mean, we go right down the list, right? We don't say the same thing. Why? I think we know why. It's hard to face that stuff. Our job is confession, nothing less. God's job, and he's faithful and just to do it, is forgiveness and cleansing and setting us free. But this is the problem of confession. It's difficult for us. If confession of sin is the pathway to experiencing more of the grace of Jesus and the restoration of relationship with God and others, then why do we resist it so much? We're conditioned in our sinful hearts and in our screwed up culture to project an image of ourselves that is not accurate. Isn't that true? My wife and I last summer were on our 25th anniversary trip. We went to Hawaii. It's, it was nice to go there. I don't think we're ever going back. It's forever away. It's, I thought it was like off the coast of California. It's like halfway to Japan. And it's, anyway, but it was fun. 
Um, and so we were on the beach one day, uh, just hanging out, and the cruise ship comes into the harbor. You could see them, and all the people get off. And I'm like, oh, great, they're going to come to our beach. And they did. And there's like four teenage girls, like in probably middle school, freshman age, came over, to our, like they're on our beach. And so they have several hours in port, you know, so they're there on the beach. I'm not kidding you. I was reading a book. I sat there for almost an hour and a half, and this is all they did on their time in port in this beautiful port in Kauai. Like, oh, no, delete, 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 all four of them taking pictures. Why? To post on their social media account to show their friends how awesome their time in port was. And all they did was stand right on the beach and take selfies. Get the perfect one. Now, maybe you're not a selfie king or queen, but we are conditioned to project an image that is not accurate, that looks just right. I was talking with a man recently who was um, newer to our church and newer to being in small groups, brand new to being in small groups, as a matter of fact. He's in a group of guys, and part of what they do is memorize scripture, pray, and confess sin. Uh, And and I said, how's it going? I was hoping it would really help him grow because he's growing in his faith. He said, well, I I like these guys, but i got to tell you, I'm really afraid they're going to find out that I'm a total fake. I said, I know how to fix that. He said, how? Tell them what's going on. What? They can't find out if you tell them. Like, they can't discover you if you out yourself, right, that you've got issues. You just say it. And you know what he said to me? He asked a question, which is a very good question. I'll bet it's a question you ask. He said, well, can't I just confess to God? It's a good question. Yes, you can just confess to God, and you should often. But why is it that confession to other people makes us so uncomfortable? Why is that so difficult for us? The best thing outside the Bible I've read on confession is by an author. Can you guess? No, it's not C.S. Lewis. I totally tricked you. (laughs) It's by a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer uh, was uh, martyred for his faith in in, in a plot to overthrow Hitler in Nazi Germany. Uh, He wrote many books. One of the books he wrote is still in print. I recommend you buy it and read it. It's a little book called Life Together. He started this book when he was running an underground seminary to try to train pastors faithful to the gospel when Nazism fell, and he finished it when he was living in prison, waiting his execution, living life together. It's brilliant on many things, particularly the issue of confession in the life of the Christian. He talks about three breakthroughs that happen in our lives when we confess, breaking through to community with each other, breaking through to the cross, and breaking through to certainty. Here's what he writes. Why is it that it's often easier for us to confess our sins to God than to a brother or sister. God is holy and sinless. He's a just judge of evil and the enemy of all disobedience. But a brother or sister is sinful as we are. They know the experience of secret sin. Let Let me ask the question this way, because I think it's very profound what he's saying. How many of you, hypothetically speaking, you have really screwed up. I don't mean you told a little white lie or you, you know, you, 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 I don't mean the small sins, and there are no small sins to God, but I mean you really messed up. And I give you two choices. Choice A, privately confess to God and be done with it. Choice B, sit in a circle of six to eight fellow Christians and tell them what you did. How many of you, given the option, would choose all things being equal? Choice A. Show of hands. <laughs> How many of you would prefer choice B? A couple of you. The rest of you who didn't put your hand up are either not listening or you're lying, right? <laughs> and you should confess that, <laughs> right? We all would choose, or at least most of us would choose, hey, I don't want to tell people. I want to deal with it privately. Why? Bonhoeffer asks why. Why is it easier for us to go alone before a holy God who we just sinned against than to sit in the company of fellow sinners who love us and can remind us of God's forgiveness. Perhaps, he says, it's because we're in danger of what he calls self-forgiveness. When we go alone, we're not really going to God. We're just talking to ourselves. And when we come into the, the, publicly in the presence of other believers, something powerful happens there. In, that, in doing that, we actually come into the presence of God in a powerful way. Bonhoeffer asserts that when you go to your brother or sister to confess, you are, in fact, going to God. In John chapter 20, this is after Jesus' resurrection, before his ascension, he comes to his disciples and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says, if you forgive anyone their sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. Well, that sounds kind of obvious. If I haven't forgiven you, I haven't forgiven you. He's saying something deeper than that. He's saying, 
Only Christ forgives sins, but you and I, followers of Christ, have a unique responsibility and opportunity to hear and remind each other of God's forgiveness. And we need that. And it's a lost practice among many of us. I'm going to guess, go out on a limb here, that for most of you in this room this morning, confession, dealing with your stuff, is not a regular part of your week. I'm gonna, I think I'm probably accurate in that. Again, from Bonhoeffer. Well, actually, James 5.16, this is why James tells in James 5.16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man, a person, is powerful and effective as it is working. Pray for each other, confess to each other. Not just when you did something wrong to that person, but deal with it in community. Again, from Bonhoeffer. A man who confesses his sins in the presence of a brother knows that he is no longer alone with himself. He experiences the presence of God in the reality of the other person. Now back to 1 John. Do you remember when we read this, verse 7? If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with, what does it say? One another. Wouldn't you expect it to say God? If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him, with God, with Christ. It's Yes, you do, but it says one another. There's something powerful that happens when we deal with what's going on in our hearts, the ugly stuff. We have fellowship with God, yes, and we're free to have greater fellowship with each other. Just think about it for a minute. What kind of relationship can you have with a person if they never know what's really going on? If you never talk about, I mean, you can, t- you can go fishing together. You can talk about the Cubs together. You can talk about your, how your kids are doing. But if you never talk about what's really going on, what you're really struggling with, the deep shame and struggles of your life, we've all got them. What kind of relationship can you have? Only to a point. What kind of relationship can you have with God if you never talk about what's really going on? He knows what's going on. It's not like you're going to inform him. God, by the way, God will never, when you tell him what's going on in your heart, go, <gasps> what? I had no idea. This is problem. Right? You go, I know. I'm glad you said it because now we can deal with it. Now you can experience grace. The fundamental reality is that sin wants to remain alone. Uh, John, in, in John's gospel, uh, later in John chapter 8, he says, men love the darkness, men and women love the darkness because their deeds are evil. How many of you like cockroaches? <laughs> I have this image burned in my mind. We used to take these mission trips to the south side of Chicago with students, and we'd sleep in this community center, and we slept right near the, where they stored the food in this kitchen area. And we would sometimes, um, well, one particular time, we went into this area to get, I think we'd stored some of our belongings in there to get them out, for, and it was nighttime, and turn the lights on, and for like a split second, you saw like a thousand cockroaches on the floor just go and scurry for cover. Yeah. (laughs) They're there, and as soon as the light's on, what do they do? They run for cover. That's a bit of a metaphor for us. It's there. But as soon as the light's turned on, we run for cover. But Jesus says, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, what does walk in light mean? This is the power of confession. The power of confession. Sin wants to keep you alone in the dark. The more isolated you are with it, the less you talk about it, the more power it has over your life. You can't say, I have fellowship with Jesus and walk in the darkness because verse 5 says that's just not true. He's light. John 8, 12 that says that Jesus is the light of the world. And in him we have the light of life. John 12, 36 says that when we believe in the light, believing in him, Jesus, the light of the world, we become children of the light. John takes those themes in his letter here and says, if we walk, he says, walking in darkness, hiding your sin, covering it up, or walking in the light. What does walking in the light mean, really? What does it mean to walk in the light? Two things. Later in John's letter, in the next chapter 2, it won't be on the screen, I'll read it for you. John says, whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother or sister is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there's no cause for stumbling. 
So first, walking in the light means walking as Jesus did, did, and that means simply living a life of love. Walking in the light means living a life of love for God and for other people. And walking in the light, second, like one and one A, <laughs> means confessing when you fail at number one. Walking in the light means living a life of love, and it means talking openly about it and dealing with it and receiving grace when I, when I fail at living up to number one. Sometimes Christians are called hypocrites. Sometimes we're rightly called hypocrites. A hypocrite is somebody who, who, who says one thing and does another, right? How many of you say you believe in the high ideal of love? We ought to be loving and gracious people. How many of you fail to live up to what you said? My hand's up. I say I believe in the high ideal of, I, I, I should forgive people, but I withhold forgiveness from those I love and those that deserve it. I say I believe in the life of selflessness and service, but I, I, I fail, I act selfishly, often. And we're all hypocrites if that's the definition. None of us lives up to perfectly those, the ideals that we espouse. So walking in the light means living a life of love for God and for others. It also means dealing with it when I fail at that. Confession. Can you confess to God privately? Yes, of course you can and you should. But sometimes, and I would suggest even often, what you need is brothers or sisters around you who love you and who love Jesus and can listen to you and can hear you and can say, yeah, that's a problem, but you're loved and you're forgiven and pray for you and hold you to it. In that, you come into the presence of God in a way that sometimes you don't in the privacy of your own room or your own mind. So if this is true, if it's true that confession is a pathway to grace, why don't we? Why is it so hard? I mean, who wants to sit around and talk about all your junk, right? It's my favorite thing. I think because deep down we don't believe what John said, he's faithful and just. I think deep down inside, in our culture, people use dirt on each other to get their way, to get a leg up, to put somebody else down. We see it in politics, see it in business, see it in sports, see it in marriages, see it in life, right? And we project that onto God and think, yes, I know the Bible says he's loving and he's forgiving, but there's got to be a statute of limitations because I did this again. How many of you have, have at least wondered, does he, I mean, if I keep doing the same thing, does he keep forgiving? Paul tells us in Romans that where sin abounds, grace super abounds. You cannot out sin God's grace. We bring it to him, and he is faithful and just to forgive us. Let me ask you a question. I've asked this question many, many times, and sometimes in sermons, sometimes privately. Here's the question What do you think God thinks of you? He does think of you. I asked this to a group of men just last week. What do you think God thinks of you? How many of you thought, when I asked that question just now, something along these lines? He loves me, but. I know he loves me, but I'm kind of a mess in this area. I know he loves me, but he's kind of being patient. I'm a work in progress. I ought to do this. I shouldn't have done that. I mean, how many of your minds go pretty quickly from he loves me to stuff you ought to be doing or shouldn't be doing? Show of hands. Almost all of us. Friends. If you're in Christ, if you've trusted in Jesus for forgiveness of your sin, if you, are, if you have turned over your life to him, that is not how God thinks of you. That's how you think of you. Moms and dads, here's the best analogy I can give you. When your kid screws up, I mean, your kids probably don't mind dead occasionally, but when they mess up, is that how you think of them? Do you, from that point on, think of your son or daughter on their worst day, defined by their worst moment? No. You are aware of it. You're a parent. But it's not how you think of them. They're, it's my boy. It's my girl. I love them. That's how God, it's, it's an imperfect analogy of how if you're in Christ, God thinks of you. He's aware of it, but it's not how he defines you. How does he define you? Let's go back to that word covering. If you're in Christ, you are covered in Christ. The blood of Jesus, we're told, covers us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You're in him. So when the Father looks at you, he doesn't see you on your worst day. He sees the goodness of his son in you, covering you. Ah, my beloved daughter, my beloved son. 
When, you, when that gets inside your mind and into your heart, confession is something you run to, not run from. You want to do. Because, you know, I, I saw on Facebook this week, and Facebook's good for maybe some things. I saw on Facebook this week this post. It's great. I think it was it's so appropriate. It said, religion equals, I really screwed up, dad's going to kill me. The gospel equals, I really screwed up, I better call dad. Isn't that a huge difference? The Christian is, I messed up, I got to call dad. How do I call dad? By praying to Jesus, by confessing. He's faithful and just. He's good. He loves you. He's not going to hold it against you. He's not going to, you know, get you. He longs for you to deal with it. Because it's the way you get put back right. We run from the stuff we most need. I'm going to read to you a longer quote from Bonhoeffer one more time. This is, it's long, but I think it's really worth it. I probably could have just read the whole chapter to you and been better than my sermon, but, you know, I did the work. So listen to what he says. It's really, really powerful. Those who remain alone with their sin are left utterly alone. It is possible that Christians may remain lonely in spite of daily worship together, prayer together, and all their community through service. That the final breakthrough to community does not occur precisely because they enjoy community with one another as pious, think self-righteous, believers, but not with one another as sinners. For the pious community permits no one to be a sinner. Hence, all have to conceal their sins from themselves and from the community. We're not allowed to be sinners. This is funny. Many Christians would be unimaginably horrified if a real sinner were suddenly to turn up among them. <laughs> so we remain alone with our sin trapped in lies and hypocrisy. For we are, in fact, sinners. However, the grace of the gospel, which is so hard for the pious to comprehend, confronts us with the truth. It says to us, you are a sinner, a great unholy sinner. Now come, as the sinner that you are, to your God who loves you. For God wants you as you are, not desiring anything from you, a sacrifice or a good deed, but rather desiring you alone. My child, give me your heart. You cannot hide from God. This is a great line. The mask you wear in the presence of other people won't get you anywhere in the presence of God. God wants to see you as you are, wants to be gracious to you. You do not have to go online to yourself and to other Christians as if you were without sin. Isn't it good? The mask you wear with other people will get you nowhere with God. Take it off. Come to him as you are. Your father who loves you says, my child, give me your heart. 1 John 1, 9, one more time. If, you, if you're like to memorize scripture, I would commit this verse to memory. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's not what you need and what you want, forgiveness and cleansing. It's what he's faithful and just to do. Let me just give you a couple of practical tips here, and then we'll wrap up about the practice of confession. First, confess consistently. Don't let the stuff build up. Find people in your life, maybe it's just one or two that you can trust, safe people who love Jesus and who love you, and talk to, to, and, and say, I'm giving you permission to ask me these questions. Just this, just this week, a guy uh, I'm friends with um, texted me and said, hey, my wife's going out of town for a number of days, and I know some of his issues. He said, I'm going to be on my own. I haven't been a bachelor in a number of years, and so just pray for me and check in with me on a couple of temptations in his life. What a great thing to do, because I know uh, he's given me permission. I've given him permission over the years to ask those questions of each other. Do it consistently. Do it specifically. Oh, Lord, I know I'm not perfect. Forgive me for my pride. I'm not going to cut it, right? Confess in community. And confess reciprocally. That's a big word. <laughs> it's hard to say. What I mean by that is, it's not good if you're the only one ever talking about what's going on. It should travel both directions. Where you're both hearing. You're both confessing. You're both talking. You're both praying for each other. This is the practice of Christians throughout the centuries. It's a pathway to experiencing grace. It's what you need. 
It's not good for your soul, your life, your family, your, your, who you're becoming for you to leave this stuff undealt with. Like a pot laying on the ground with this dirt spilled out, right? It's, nothing's going to grow there. And God longs to be gracious to you. So I'm going to give you a chance to do that right now. We're going to come up one by one. And you'll have them. No. <laughs> I'm only kidding. What we are going to do is I give you just a moment right where you sit to confess it. Because here's the spiritual challenge for the week. Uh, we, each week we've had these spiritual challenges, things that you can put into practice in your life. And here's how I want you to, should you choose to accept it, here's your challenge. End each day this week with a time of confession before the Lord by praying these two psalms. Start with Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. So pray, search me, O God. Then sit with him and let him speak to you. Maybe you call her the truth. Maybe you reacted harshly. Maybe you, whatever it is. And then pray Psalm 32, verses 1 and 5. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. I acknowledge my sin but to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So right now, where you sit, I'd like you just to bow your head and speak to your Father who loves you. Father God, it's hard for us to be honest. Something in us wants to run from the light and from you. We don't want to say the same thing about our sins as you say. But teach us that you are faithful and just. You alone can be trusted. And you already know the truth. So help us learn to speak openly and honestly with you, our Father, and with each other about what's really going on. Let this not be a church where people pretend, put on masks, but by your grace, we are a collection of people who sin and have been freely forgiven by your grace. Help us to walk in that grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.